<laughs> I'm gonna, I mean, this is a huge sweeping broad generalization, but the only good records made by white people in the last 50 years have been inspired by dark blues songs. I mean, whether it's the Rolling Stones or Led Zeppelin or the, the Bad Seeds, I mean, it's, there's something about the simplicity and the honesty and the sexuality and the darkness of whether it's John Lee Hooker, Lightning Hopkins, you know, these old traditional blues that have inspired, you know, people like the Bad Seeds to make great records. The whole idea of uh, uh, First Born Is Dead was ostensibly to make a, a blues album, inverted commas, and this was done with full knowledge that we weren't really capable of making a traditional blues album, so it was going to come out as something quite different from the outset. Um, but just to try and enter uh, that world. It was really the first time that he'd seriously uh, approached that whole blues aesthetic and um, made some strange and uh, fucked up version of it him himself. He was trying to, um, to, to work out his personal relationship to... Uh, to Americana, maybe to uh, to the, let's say the, let's say the blues, or let's say to some uh, early uh, early black American music. In the Manchester tradition, we had a way of sort of shunning tradition. So therefore, if you came up with an idea that was sort of uh, had been baked in the blues, then you would want to disguise it pretty fast. Dylan, in exactly the same way, whilst being heralded as a kind of um, uh, you know, priest of counterculture was secretly a huge fan of of what Grail Marcus went on to call the old weird, weird America. You know, he was absolutely steeped in folk song, in country music, in in the old kind of standards that that you'd have thought listening to Blonde on Blonde had just been blasted out of the water forever. Anyone who's like real about what they're doing, they're gonna get that thing, you know, and. Because it is the bottom of music. It's what all, all the modern music, anyway, is made out of. You know, it's like, so a lot of bands come and they play this kind of music. They've never heard of these guys. They never know where this music comes from. And it's almost like they don't got the basement of their building. The notion of the blues uh, in this, as uh, the Bad Seeds sort of interpret it, um, is really incredible. Um, you know, just having never heard anything like that any sort of interpretation like that and still to this day nothing like that um just completely different from any sort of you know stevie ray vaughan bullshit or, or whatever um but really just taking that almost the essence of of the blues um and just distilling it to its its purest form when we were discussing making that album you know and there's this idea oh, let's make a blues album you know this thing about the kind of blues aspects and to me the the strength of the blues is about its kind of atmospheres and it was must have been an obvious decision to go back to Hansa and record that that album there they asked me if i wanted to go out to berlin to make the next record and uh, again it was like wow this is you know chance of a lifetime i mean at that time berlin it's like the last outpost for the west and had this sort of very romantic and yet very in the Cold War sort of feel to it. Around that place, you could still feel the devastation of that great war, and uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of very bad vi vibes in a way that made room for for great new creations. The sound of that studio is all over the first born is dead. You know, that's how that room so that when you hear all that sound, the atmosphere around those songs, it's the sound of that room. What is that? That's an old Nazi ballroom, basically. That's a huge old room with one hell of a live sound. And that's the live sound you're hearing on Bowie's vocals, on uh, Heroes and stuff like that, some of the Iggy recordings. I started, I guess, collecting um, Bad Seeds material and Birthday Party material probably in 80, oh, Birthday Party in 82 and became quite a, an obsessive collector. I'm quite an obsessive collector of things. When I first knew Andrew, he had a lot of, I guess, live things, cuttings, just 
lots of bits and pieces that he'd have collated from here, they're everywhere. You know, my then girlfriend uh, visited a record shop in Exeter. And over the um, speakers came this fantastic song and I listened to it a while and I quite liked it. And then I realised, almost to my horror, that this was Nick Cave and I had to go home to Andrew and tell him. Up until that point in time, she actually banned me from listening to the birthday party and the bad seeds in our apartment. Um, so it was that decision, which I must say was a wise decision on her point, uh, triggered me to um, offer her a marriage proposal. And you kind of wonder, what would have happened if I hadn't have converted? <laughs> would we be here today? So after 22 years of marriage, um, the song Tupelo had, a, a, I guess, um, great um, emotional value. So when I see the Bad Seas play that now, it's kind of, uh, I listen to it with a, with a big smile because I probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Tupelo. He plays that a lot live and it's the one that starts off with an amazing thunderstorm. And then it... Doo -doo 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 and then it just builds up. The, the bass is, um, has this sort of driving, um, repetitive um, rhythmic feel to it, which is what good bass playing should be. Barry Adamson had done this bass line for St Huck on the, on From Her to Eternity, and uh, I don't know what part of Tupelo Nick had, but the basic, he, our instruction was to basically go out there and to... Uh, create some kind of bass line and undertow that was similar to St Huck and for some reason I, I ended up on the bass and Barry was on the drum. I don't know why that was. I was playing a sort of my interpretation of, of the thunder, I think, coming over uh, the song, you know, that to, to begin Tupelo and setting the scene that way. So he inverted St Huck, so we were back in a similar... Uh, on similar ground, but working things in, in another way altogether. Instead of it went, which was the Tupelo baseline, and ended up to be the Tupelo baseline. But um, it was just some some as these things happen. It was just them playing around. Musically, his roots um, are are, uh, are interesting and convoluted and thoroughly inbred. Uh, but for all the, the, you know, the elements of Southern Gothic or, you know, he sort of became a, a poster boy for uh, what emerged as goth later on. But I, I think that um, one of the, the human elements he brings as an artist is that he really has a sense of the folkloric that you get a sense of the oral tradition. The narrative of Tupelo seems to be built around the birth of Elvis in Tupelo, uh, but it also could be the birth of Christ. I loved that fusion um, of the Presley, Presley myth with the, um, the flood story. Um, and I think I might've even been aware that, uh, yeah, I think I might've already been aware that, 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 it, that Nick was doing two lots of writing at the same time, that, that, that this was exposing part of the background to the novel that was a long time coming yet, but that he was already working on. It's almost like um, taking the emotion of the thing inside out and sort of cross pollinating it across a whole range of different things. So it's about one thing and then it's about another thing. Then it's about, oh, and let's, let's not forget the flood. It's about this giant flood and this, you know, colossal storm uh, when Elvis is born, being born and uh, it's drawing on um, John Lee Hooker's song from 1959, Tupelo Blues. And, and, uh, but it's, it's just sort of using the weather as uh, something, uh, you know, saying, hey, look, something really cataclysmic is, is happening. Got to remember that um, <laughs> Elvis, Elvis was uh, not a particularly hip figure at that stage. Uh, I mean, he was, what, seven years dead? Um, and it was seven years after punk. I, you know, you can remember, remember in the, when he died in the middle of punk, a lot of people laughed. But it's also a biblical reference, uh, firstborn is dead, isn't it? Because that was, that's what Herod uh, basically ordered when he was uh, trying, to, uh, trying to kill off, um, uh, what was that, Moses? Yeah, if you're really looking for a great song, go to the Bible. I mean, everyone's done it from Dylan to... Um... Leonard Cole to Nick Cave to Michael Jackson. 
uh, earth song is is biblical references. So uh, you can't go wrong with the Bible. You know, it's mythic. It's like a mythical record, you know. And I guess you know, it's just I love it. The whole deep blues thing and the de development of that, I guess, biblical language was, I think, a way of kind of distancing himself from everything else that was going on around him, but actually, you know, it gave him a voice to be able to express, you know, things that were contemporary and that were going on around him. When Nick was living in Berlin, he was one of the people that no matter how you know, much fun and uh, excesses we all had, he was constantly working and working really hard in uh, an atmosphere where there was not a lot of discipline, really. He was, uh, no matter what, one of the more disciplined people and, um, and really like uh, developing uh, something, a world, um, of its own in in his head in, with his writing. Uh, the German philosopher Alexander Kluge says uh, that telling stories by cross mapping um, is a very modern way of telling a story. Cross mapping means, in Alexander Kluge's sense, um, that you, for example, uh, travel a, a forest with the with the map of London City. So um, you 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 draw from from things you know and that are real and that are from our world and but you cross map it with with a fictional uh, powerful uh, ideas and I think that's exactly what Nick Cave had done on the whole album and all the eight songs that are on it. It's in this way probably a conceptual album. He's not a, a, a kind of a light or simple person when it comes to writing. He's, he's, a, he's a very highly developed literary artist already. He spent obviously a lot of time and from very early on uh, developing the craft of, of writing, writing novels, you know, and uh, stories. I think he's a great storyteller. Maybe it was easier for Nick Cave to complete an album made of art, eight songs uh, that all took place in the in the in the land that the ass or the angel uh, describes, rather than finishing the novel in time. Oddly, I've always thought of Nick more of as an author than as a sort of songwriter because it's that Southern Gothic, but a specific. A specific place in Southern Gothic literature. Tupelo kicks the record off, and it's a great song. But you know, uh, I think I was aiming to be a little more. You know, the the single is a song that everyone's kind of gonna go towards, and and that's a song that the DJs are gonna play. And I went deep into the record and hit song number two. At, at that point, you could see. The, the sort of literary aspirations in, in Cave's work were maybe closer to the music. So there was a sense that, I mean, that song to me, it feels slightly inspired by Nabokov, who's a, a writer that, uh, that Cave has talked about being, uh, being influenced by and having a lot of fondness for. Um, but it, but it, you can feel him sort of working out different ideas. And I mean, it's such a, such a, a curious song. What drew me to say goodbye to the little girl tree, you know, was just like the minimal, minimalism of it. It's just like the spare kind of hi-hat thing. And this little guitar figure. The way they arranged, arranged the what instruments they they chose to put on them, it really showed. Um, it was really kind of visionary. I thought, particularly you know the earlier albums, like hardly having any guitar, it would seem, or or if it was guitar, you, you didn't really know what it was doing, and um, you know, which at the time was so kind of at odds with with what was going on. That was like a chain reaction where also other people have to react differently or play differently to somebody playing guitar like Blixer did. For me, as a left-handed person that plays the guitar like a right-handed person, it was also meant very much that I played slide. I think that's probably the reason why I started playing slide with the bad seats and never stopped doing that. 
mean, when I started playing guitar, it was like all I listened to and all I played was metal. So, um, you know, it was just all about playing really fast and and uh, just shredding and, you know, technique and sort of things. But um, I guess I, know, I was probably like 15 or 16 when I first heard the Bad Seeds and, um, you know, especially what what uh, Blixa was doing with sort of non-playing and uh, different tunings and, and uh, slide guitar. It, it just, um, you know, sort of like a wake-up call, like, oh, of course, you know, there's a lot more that the instrument can do. Well, Blixa, of course, um, was, you know, brought in a really interesting wild card element, which um, which I, I like the abrasive edge that that, that could bring in um, when he decided to uh, pull out his chops and his scrunks. It's always good to have a unique guitar player as your guitar player. The band, I thought, really, I don't know, they obviously came together for me, you know, the early the early albums just don't kind of I just don't get them. But I guess once Blixer joined, for some reason, uh, some inexplicable reason as well, because I could never really figure out what Blixer was doing. Um, that as a band, as a sound, as a tool for Nick's lyrics, I thought they were just they they were on fire. It was fantastic. They were unbeatable, really, really superb, and they're great still. They're really, really good. <clears throat> it seemed like such a kind of vital, um, a vital kind of group of people um, doing something and really sort of doggedly determined and really like focused and, and um, you know, as an onlooker, that was, that was just so kind of, um, so in really so inspiring and uh, encouraging, you know, I guess. Um, I certainly had no, you know, I never even in my wildest dreams would have thought that I would one day be involved in it. Um, but uh, it was just so kind of fantastic to see the way that they would go into different areas and, and um, just really fearlessly. We weren't, I mean, I think we succeeded better than we expected to with that record because it actually did achieve what we were trying to achieve, which was to not actually make a blues record, to make, but to make an album that had uh, certain atmospheres and the intention and the feel of blues without having any of the uh, genre trappings of that type of music uh, or not being dependent on the trappings of that music. You know, the, the easy kind of... 12 bar structures or the sevenths or the blues scale and doing guitar solo and all these sorts of things. I don't think any of the songs um, have any of those musical uh, structures in them. In some respects, it went right against the grain of the way that people were recording at that time, which was very clinical, very dry, very precise, uh, quite synthetic doesn't seem like a record that was like, hey, this is an 80s record <laughs> by any means. You know, it doesn't have uh, 80s production. It doesn't uh, have 80s style songs. It was, uh, in, in a sense, Firstborn is Dead is a timeless sounding record. In the mid 80s, there was a canon and it was the Beatles and it was the Stooges and it was the Velvet Underground and it was uh, noise music uh, and it was punk rock and uh you know that lineage was established and it was you know uh, you know you had to have those records and you had to know about them and, and they were good and they were fine it's not a problem but he, nick cave was clearly knowing about those records just subtly kind of created a completely alternative uh universe of uh uh um inspiration that was part of being there that was uh, that's what i was there for it was like you know, uh, listening to the pop group and the early birthday party and, and getting that sort of like, you know, two fingers up to everything, feeling with what you were doing and, and the kind of art that you were trying to carve out and the kind of expression that you were getting at and, and communicate and, and just, you know, as well as sort of watching an artist develop themselves in the way Nick was develop, developing himself. Nick at the time had a real bad uphill struggle against the Goths because they were trying to make him to be like a male Susie 
<laughs> in terms of popular culture and what that word me means in a music, you know, as a rock performer, it's so inadequate when it comes to Nick. It was beyond goth. I mean, goth was a trend to me like new romantic, you know, just slap on some black makeup. Um, so Nick was, he did Black Crow King almost. It was like another blues thing, but it was almost like saying, yeah, I am the Black Crow King. I'm, you know, I'm beyond all you um, guys walking around listening to your Cure records. You know? This is what I like in Nick's work is that there's actually, there's a humor to it as well, a, along with the sadness and the darkness, which is, you know, can be all encompassing, but it's still, it's funny because there's a humor to his, his work, as far as I'm concerned, that isn't there with like Nick Drake. It just isn't. It's just, or even, or even uh, um, Elliot Smith. It's just, oh God, it's awful. Whereas, you know what? It's awful, but there's, there's, a, there's still humor in it. You have to find humor. You have to be able to laugh. Otherwise, what's the fucking point? I'm, you know, a, a lyric head. I mean, that to me, um, you know, although I, I do appreciate and love music and I'm emotionally moved by the music, uh, the lyrics are what really call out to me. And, you know, I study them and, uh, you know, uh, dissect them and things like that. And, uh, uh, I'm really uh, in awe in, you know, in terms of con his, his contemporaries. I think Nick stands head and shoulders above, you know, the people of his era. It's one of the reasons why uh, Nick Cave uh, was such a kind of um, important artist for me as a teenager is because he was the portal through which you discovered so much. He had read a lot of prison literature and he'd read the In the Belly of the Beast and, and that stuff... Um, kind of, uh, he, he uh, I noticed he kind of channeled because he, he was so uh, always working and had an incredible sort of output of work. Knocking on Joe is something that Nick couldn't really have written, I don't think, earlier. You know, it's, it's too melodic, it's too um, heartfelt. There's just something about the architecture of that song. It's as if the music hangs from the words and the words are, are nailed that that break the nancy's body the those hiatuses to hear the early bad sea stuff used to take my breath away because it left space it would leave drama it would leave holes it would leave these great gaping holes and then it would fill them with this vivid inky lyric that you you know was such an immediate and intoxicating image. I was always fascinated by the way that that song moved from being unbearably sparse, like nothing seeming to happen between beats or between bars to this kind of rolling climax. It used to puzzle me. How, how am I being utterly moved and engaged with the song about a, a prisoner who's, you know, kind of self mutilating as a way of, of, of as his only means of escape. But it's it's a bigger metaphor, isn't it? You it's so beautifully written and so beautifully structured. You're you're engaged. You don't have you don't. It's not about empathy. It's about um, it's about feeling. It's just about an immediacy of feeling. You know, it just sort of lands on you like a like if you were taking niacin and you know you get flushed. You know, that, or any anything that that opens up your capillaries. It's like sort of all of a sudden you realize that they're playing a level higher than they were a second ago. It just seemed like a sort of magic trick every time I heard it. How did, how did they get from almost silence to something that was like a crescendo? Nick's music's inherently haunted. I think that uh, uh, so much of his creative impulses come out of basically uh, a way of keeping the demonology at bay. So um, he's, you know, he's somebody where... Uh, I think inherently the the lights kind of go down a bit in the room <laughs> when when he starts looking at it and and the shadows lurk and and uh, and you, you you get some sort of uh, you know mystical uh, queasy uh, feeling uh, in, you know invested into uh, you know into into whatever uh, his his pen or his tongue uh, caresses. You know he, he grew up in outback Australia and Melbourne and never been to the south. So he kind of takes these influences and appropriates them. You know, Faulkner, Flannery O'Connor, um, 
Carson McCullers, these, these kind of people that really influenced him and, and his writing. And I think it just like, it was definitely a, a step up into a, a new level lyrically at that time that was necessary that he had to be, that he was forced to be doing in his, uh, you know, in his career as an, as an artist. And that, and I think it, it was basically like the, the literary uh, uh, evolution of his, of his work that, you know, that uh, an outfit like the um, birthday party just couldn't suit anymore. Nick's Deep South fixation, which was already running rampant ever since Swampland, you know, he was writing his book. Um, I got well into the blues. Um, it made me, and I'll always thank, thank Nick for this, um, made me investigate gospel music and blues. So you start investigating this stuff and it becomes like a trail for you to investigate as like, you know, a fan or whatever. You start thinking, well, who is, who is this blues person and why is this important? And you start, you know, going out and buying other records and investigating other things. So I think that for me, that second album really did that. It kind of it set you on that path. One of the things that made The Firstborn is Dead such a really fascinating artifact to me as a teenager was um, the sleeve notes, which were written... I don't know by whom, because I actually checked and there's there's not a credit on the vinyl version anyway of the, who wrote the sleeve notes. So I, I'm hoping it was, they were written by Nick, but I don't know. Um, but they were written in a kind of style that I've subsequently come to recognize as being the kind of thing you get on jazz liner notes, you know, faintly reverential and using a slightly kind of detached, um, sort of almost paternal tone. Almost like... Um you get on a folkways record or something like that. I think they were, it was kind of very much an exercise in Americana and almost a bit too, um, going a bit too far in that way to the point of being a bit hokey. And there's a great line about Wanted Man, uh, which tells the story of how it was a Dylan song, which Dylan wrote for Cash and that nobody could quite remember the words. Although actually I've checked subsequently and, and he gets most of the words pretty, pretty much right. Um, I didn't hear the Cash version for years though. Um, and um, anyway, it tells the story of, of how the song came to be recorded. It makes it sound deliciously casual, as if they were just mucking about one day and they came, came up with the idea. Nick came in one day and said, I want to do a Bob Dylan song. And he, start, he sung the couple of verses that were of the original and said, I think the chord changes go la, 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 la. So Mick played along or somebody played along and they sang it and they... He put down the basic guide, but then he went away and wrote about another 25 verses. That I really, really loved because he Cave completely rewrote that and the lyrics were just totally outrageous. And if you listen to the Johnny Cash original, which is on uh, San Quentin Live album, um, it's, you know, fairly tame. And then in Nick's version, he just takes it and, you know, twirls it around and kicks it and throws it out the window and picks it up again and twirls it around some more. I mean, it's, this is the wild song, just relentless. And I can remember struggling for about 18 hours, just trying to get all the elements to gel. And I remember Mick coming in and I was pulling my hair out. And Mick went, oh, sounds really good. Well, all we need to do is just cut a load of stuff out and then gradually add it in as it goes along. And so we started doing that. And as we started doing it, so more and more people from the band who've been sitting around getting bored, going out, coming back, here's still the track going around and me getting more and more riled, um, suddenly started to hear it coming together. And I just remember the finish, the final mix, there was everybody in the band was doing something. I think uh, Nick was like putting reverb on his harmonica. Just everybody had something to do. And it was one of those things where the final mix became like a, a total performance, unrepeatable, you know, like a great gig. You know an artist is great when they could do great covers. And I think Nick does great covers. I think, uh, you know, Bob is a master at doing covers. You know, it's kind of like he took uh, ownership of that song. It's a hard thing to do, especially if it, a song's written by Bob Dylan and kind of made real by Johnny Cash, you know? I, I would love to hear Nick do a cover of 
something like sooner or later one of us must know from the um, uh, blonde on blonde era. I mean, that would be, I think, an amazing kind of uh, thing to hear because, uh, you know, they they both can can sing those bittersweet love songs so so great. It's it's certain artists or certain people, creators of any kind of expression, uh, kind of distill their influences in a way that uh, becomes, and of course, some who also learn and studied for themselves, self-taught themselves so much because they had such a desire and such a love to learn everything and to use everything through their own focus, you know, to let everything kind of go through their own filtering system and grow with it and then not to replicate necessarily. So like when like Nick made the album of blues, like the second album, it's, uh, yeah, again, it's not to necessarily to shine a light directly on the blues itself, but to to have the blues form or the blue whatever the blues meant means to to him like it's just a very subjective thing talking about uh the firstborn is dead you know i was listening to a lot of country blues uh namely uh uh fred mcdowell and uh john lee hooker lightning hopkins um sun house blind willie johnson uh blind willie mctell all the blind willies and you don't got to know every specific blues artist. Man, I don't even know half of them, you know. You just got to understand that, that that's where music come from. And these guys bled when they played. And if you can combine them kind of things and whatever kind of music you're doing, you're going to be, you know, as authentic as you can ever be. And that's all anyone can hope to be, you know, is to be able to be, like, honest when they play. And, yeah, I guess the key thing is the, it was real. And... I could never really look at, you know, the bunny when Teardrop Explodes, the Smiths as kind of, as real. There were moments uh, in there uh, where, you know, you could feel, you could smell what was going on. And it comes out of the record. It it sort of bleeds out of every pore of the record in, in a most kind of powerful way. It's your life co co experience combined with that, that, uh, feeling of where the blues come from and all the bottom of music, you know, then you, I guess if you want to call it authentic, then you authentic because you have opened yourself up to the real thing. And, uh, and you, oh, that's all, all of us are trying to do, you know, like if you have any intention of like talking the talk and walking the walk, all you're trying to do is open yourself up so that the music come out of you properly, you know? I would let those songs reverberate through me in almost a, f a kind of chaotic, self-destructive way. And at the same time, I recognized that what was going on was just an incredible, possibly, piece of work that had never been done before by its sort of regurgitation through this historical place. There is one song that allows me to travel through time. It's called Blind Lemon Jefferson. The music itself captures the, uh, the, the mood of the lyrics. It, it's summed up by this kind of slow, rhythmic drive. And it's, it's also the sense that the bass is really coming to the forward in the kind of the Bad Seeds sound. And bass is hugely important on the Bad Seeds records. Um, a lot, of, well, Blind Lemon Jefferson uh, really revolved around Barry's bass line. And I'd played this quivering bass that was throbbing from the inside out. And um, flo I walked in the studio and the loudest thing in the track was this, you know, wobbling sort of bass line, which made the thing sort of like just sort of hover. I don't know what the effect is called, but like a whoom. Part of the bass sound on that I remember is like the actual bass, but then the sound of the room, like, captured from like 30 feet away and really over exaggerated so the bass just feels as though it's just coming from everywhere as if you're standing in the room next to the bass player and you're being enveloped by the bass 
you know, and I tried to play it like, uh, <clears throat> bass is a bit loud, don't you think? You know, but I knew that those were the elements that were making things work really well. You really get a sense of this kind of momentum, but it's a slow, painful momentum, like this old guy with his, you know, as he says in the song, you know, tap, tap, tapping with his cane. You know, even when he starts singing, it's like blind, Lem, Jefferson. Does it come in? Tap. You know, it's just space. Basically, I'm playing slide guitar like I'm trying to play minimalist music. I'm not doing much. I just couldn't believe that there was anyone who had such a great sense for atmosphere. And I've always thought, I've always thought that when I heard Blind Lamb Jefferson, which I did, I went out and bought the, you know, some rubbish compilation uh, and listened to those recordings, which of course were made, uh, musicologists will correct me, I'm sure, but either in the late 1920s, maybe the early 30s, but really a long time ago. Uh, they have that quality of static uh, because they were recorded by him shouting into a big horn and a needle etching it onto something made out of wax. This music builds on a on a on a treasure chest of songs that have been written by others, and that Nick Cave is just carrying the torch, but just in a in a very positive sense. He he took the torch. That song has that quality, that absolute quality of like having existed in some pre-modern period and just kind of been parachuted down a time tunnel to land on this record. And you could just feel it. It's like you knew that they knew, not in an arrogant way, but in a realistic way, that they were doing something nobody else was doing, you know. And, uh, and that's what makes for great bands, you know, not, not necessarily great albums or tours, but in this case, yes, but, but you know, great bands are become great when they are trying to do something that they don't see anybody else doing. You know? And that's really, there was nobody anywhere near their league at the time. Being in Nick Cave in the Bad Seas was the first place where, you know, you could, you were, it was almost, you know, a given thing that you had to get inside and sort of put the thing like poof, on the table and go, there it is. You know, there was no sort of, you know, there was sort of disguised kind of pussyfooting, if you like, but really what was going on is that like people were in there bearing their stuff like you know until it hurt to get this thing out and so you are literally inside what's going on Star spangled and the coins in my pocket go jingle. 